minister with the Church of Christ here in Ashland, Wisconsin, and we had intended to meet together for the first time in several months this Lord's Day morning. However, after consulting with some of the other leadership of the congregation, as well as consulting with those in the congregation, we felt that it would be best for us to continue meeting online until July the 5th, and we'll reassess leading up to July the 5th, and we will see and go from there. Now, this is not being recorded at the church building. This is actually being recorded at my house in my office. And I wanted to get on here this morning and share some thoughts with you. Um, as some of you know, I work for a public transit company. That is my secular job. However, several years back, I used to work in law enforcement. Uh, as both a deputy sheriff and correctional officer for two different departments. And so I've had quite a few people ask me what my thoughts and my opinions are regarding the situation surrounding law enforcement, policing, that sort of thing. And I'm not really interested in getting on here and sharing with you a bunch of opinions. Uh, that's for another time and place. What I am interested, though, is sharing with you some thoughts regarding these matters from God's Word. And a text that comes to my mind is a text in the book of Micah, one of the minor prophets. In particular, chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, With what shall I come before the Lord? and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn of my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? So here is the situation going on in this text. Micah, who is referred to as one of the minor prophets, is speaking to Judah. Now, up to this point, God has been trying to get his people to repent. By this point in history, the northern kingdom of Israel was already taken into captivity by the Assyrians. The Assyrians were eventually uh, overtaken and conquered by the Babylonians. And now God is telling them, hey, the Babylonians are coming. I'm going to hand you over to them. And eventually this would happen. In 586 BC, the Babylonians came in and cleaned house. King Nebuchadnezzar uh, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, destroyed the walls of Jerusalem, and took many of the people into captivity. But leading up to this point, God wanted his people to repent. He wanted them to turn back to him. And when we look at this text, you, you really have to understand what's going on in the first five verses. Because in the first five verses, God gives his indictment of Israel. And in fact, he asked them, he says, with, he, he says earlier in the text, I'll actually flip back over to it. You know, he reminds them of what he had done for them, bringing them up out of the land of Egypt, and all the wonderful things that he had done for them, yet they rebelled against him. So when you get to verse 6, he says, With what shall I come before the Lord? This is Micah speaking. And bow myself before God on high. And he mentions several different types of sacrifice. He even talks about harming his own body. Shall I give this to purge my soul of sin? No. In verse 8, he says, He has told you, O man, what is good. 
In other words, this problem was not an issue due to lack of intellectual knowledge. They knew good and well what God expected. They just didn't want to do it. They would rather rebel. But he says, He has told you, O man, what is expected of you. What does God require? He mentions three things. Do justice. Love kindness. Walk humbly with your God. These three things, I, I think, answer the question of how a Christian should respond to these things going on in our world. You know, first it was a pandemic, now we have all this civil unrest. And I know a few weeks ago I, I did a lesson on the Christian's response, but this, what's really going through my mind now is the fact that this is the time for Christians to take a stand. And I think this text offers us three things that God expects of his people. And the first thing that Micah mentions here, he says to seek justice, or if you want to look at this in a more literal sense, do the works of judgment, or do the works of the ordinance, ordinances of God, if you want to think of it in a more literal sense. Uh, I guess you could think about it this way. The, the works we do are an overflow of what God has done for us. We do good works because of what God has done for us. You have Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, uh, James 2, 14 through 26, as well as Matthew 5, 13 through 16 that talk about this. These works are an overflow of what God has done for us, and it's in these works that we are to fulfill this. Uh, these works are in line with the word and the nature of God. For example, in Galatians chapter 5, 22 through 25, the Bible says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step or walk according to the Spirit. One of the biggest issues in Micah's day was the fact that the system was rigged. The system was unjust. This is, this is systematic injustice, folks. Uh, this system was predicated by unjust, unrighteous people who would judge very unfairly to the poor, to, uh, I guess, as, as Jesus would refer to them in Matthew 25 as the least of these. And it was this systematic injustice that angered God, and it angers him just as much today as it did then as well. And I want you to notice, if you look on down in Micah 6, notice how God feels about this. This is, a verse, this is verses 11 through 13 of Micah 6. He says, Shall I acquit the man with wicked scales and with a bag of deceitful weights? In other words, what he's saying here, folks, is, you know, he talks about wicked scales. You know, it's where... He, a person would charge so much for per pound in the market. Well, in the market, well, he would have his scales offset so he would get more money for less product. He says, "What am I to do with this wicked person that's going to take advantage and be deceitful, be unjust?" He says, "Your rich men." This is verse twelve. Continuing, he says, "Your rich men are full of violence." Your inhabitants speak lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Therefore, I strike you with a grievous blow, making you desolate because of your sins. Folks, God is just as angry today as he was then at the injustice of mankind. Now, we are fallen creatures. We are going to see injustice because there is always going to be ungodly people. 
human beings, as history has proven to us time and time and time again, are capable of horrific things. But folks, God, God does not stand for it. And God is angered by injustice just as much today as he was back in the Old Testament. Micah says that we are to seek justice. The second aspect that is mentioned in the text is to love kindness. He says, seek justice, love kindness. Or some translations will say love mercy. And when you look at this phrase, love kindness, in the original Hebrew, it's a very strong way of writing. In a literal sense, it says to zealously love showing kindness or mercy. You know, we live in a world that is very unloving. A world that is very unkind. And I think in a lot of ways, this outside influence has affected the church. It has affected us. It has infiltrated the church. We've become very selfish. It's not about how can we serve one another, it's how about how can we serve ourselves. We've forgotten what Jesus said in John chapter 13, 34 and 35. He says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I find it interesting Jesus said what would show the world that we are his disciples wasn't the particular name that we choose to put over the door or the, you know, idiosyncrasies of our worship or our dogma. No, he says, how's the world going to recognize you as my people? He says, they're going to see how you love one another. They're going to see how you show love. And I understand there are going to be people that will say, Preacher, you know, this whole showing love thing, it's, it's really not that important, right? Well, I want you to notice something that John says in 1 John chapter 3, 7 through 10. Notice what the Bible says. He says, Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Verse 10, pay attention to it. He says, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Now in verses 7 through 9, John outlines to us what it means to be righteous versus unrighteous. Who is righteous, who is not righteous? He says the one who is righteous is going to practice righteous. The one who is unrighteous is not. But notice what he says in verse 10 again. He says, by this it is evident who are the children of, children of God and who are the children of the devil. In other words, who belongs to God and who belongs to the devil? And notice there are only two options here. There's no middle ground. You're either a child of God or you're a child of the devil, plain and simple. What are the defining factors? He says, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. God. Now, that's pretty self-explanatory, right? You know, you cannot say, well, I'm a Christian and practice unrighteousness. It doesn't work like that. We cannot continue in sin that grace may abound. Romans 6 talks about that. So, he says, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. That makes sense. But what's hard is what he says next. He says, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Now, folks, that's hard-hitting. 
Because if we think about what that means, that should be a wake-up call to us. You see, what this means is I can go to church every Sunday, but if I don't love, then guess what? I'm not going to heaven. I may think that I do all these good works and, and I'm serving God, but guess what? If I don't seek love, I'm eternally condemned. That's what the text says. Who belongs to God? Who belongs to Satan? Well, if you don't practice righteousness and if you don't seek love, guess what? You're not a child of God. And I find it interesting. Paul mimics the underlying idea of this in his address to the Corinthians. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 through 3, it's a text many of us are very familiar with. Notice what the Bible says. Verse 1, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understanding of all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if, if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Now, we need to understand what's going on in the church at Corinth. They have been arguing and bickering over all these different issues. Well, I got this gift, or you've got that gift, or I've got this ability, and you've got that ability, and, well, I, I want this gift, or I want this ability, because it's a lot better than this other one. They're arguing and bickering, and Paul says, time out, we got to hold the phone here. All of this doesn't matter if love is not the motivating factor. I mean, he mentions having all knowledge, having all faith, having all gifts. And he says, if you don't have love, none of that's going to matter. And I think that's one of the things that God, ex the reason why this is one of the things God expects of us. Yes, we must seek justice. We must seek after uh, God's ordinances, following God's word. But we also must seek love as well. And this leads to the third aspect that is mentioned. The third thing that God expects of us, and that is to walk humbly with God. He says, seek justice, love mercy or love kindness, and walk humbly with God, or literally from the original Hebrew, walk submissively with God. You know, as Christians, we have been called to bring our lives in subjection to Christ. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6, for though we walk in the flesh, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we are not waging war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Folks, as Christians, we have been called to live transformed lives in Christ. Romans 12, 1 and 2 in particular talks about this. Coincidentally, we are not to walk as the world walks. Now, what does this mean? Well, this means that our lives are not going to look at the look like the world. And you know, when we as Christians walk walk in counter to the culture, you know, we are going to stand out. We are not going to blend in, but we are not called to blend in. We are called to be light in a dark room. Matthew 5, 13 through 16 talks about that. In that text, we're called to be salt. We're called to be like a city set on a hill, like a light in a dark room. And we understand how the world works. They're not going to come to the darkness, but we are called to shine the light of Christ into the darkness, in particular, John 3, verses 19 through 21 talk about this, as well as John chapter 1 talks about this as well. We choose, we must choose to walk with God and not with the world. 
That's what we are called to do as Christians. Now, someone might say, you know, preacher, I understand this. You know, I, you know, I understand this concept of, you know, I need to seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly with God. But I, I look at all this that's going on in the world. In a practical sense, how do I respond? What am I supposed to do? Well, I think there are three things things, three applications that um, that we can make when we're trying to think about the Christian's response, because I understand, you know, there are a lot of people that are concerned about this, and we think, what can we do? We see the injustice, we see the things that are happening in our world. What can Christians do? How can Christians respond? And I think there are three applications from this text. I think the first thing that we need to consider is that uh, we do not need to give in to the vengeance or the bloodlust of these people that are perpetrating so many evil acts these days. You know, I think about Proverbs 22, 24 through 25. It says, Make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. Folks, we need to be careful who we surround ourselves with in a practical sense. You know, let's say you want to be part of a peaceful protest. That's great, but you better make sure that it's a peaceful protest. You know, it, it is our constitutional right in this country under the First Amendment. We have the right of assembly, and rightfully so. But you better make sure that you're not gathering with wrathful people. Otherwise, you might be on the receiving end of those rubber bullets and tear gas. Why? Because if it turns violent, you don't want to be in that mix. Another verse that I would give you as well is Isaiah 59, 7 through 8. Here the Bible says, their feet run to evil. They are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Desolation and destruction are their highways. The way of peace they do not know, and there is no justice in their paths. They have made their roads crooked. No one who treads on them knows peace. Folks, this text is also repeated again in Romans chapter 3 if you want to look that up a little bit later. But I find it interesting. You can read this text and you can think about the rioters and What's going on? He says their feet run to evil. They want to perpetrate their evil deeds. They are swift to shed innocent blood. Folks, you can't tell me when, when, a, when a rioter or rioters are burning down a business that it's that business's fault. That business owner is innocent, yet you are damaging, you are hurting someone that is innocent. It says their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, desolation and destruction are are in their highways folks when we don't seek peace we see what's happening he says the way of peace they do not know and there is no justice in their paths folks you know i think about what happened in minneapolis you know those officers were charged did that end the riots no why because they do not know Peace. Folks, he, he, here's the thing. We cannot cast our lot with people who want to seek vengeance in response to injustice. Yes, we see the injustice, but we cannot give to vengeance. As is said in Romans chapter 12, God says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. That is not our place. This leads me to the second consideration in response. Not only <clears throat> not only do we not to be should we not be given to vengeance and bloodlust, but also we need to be praying for our leaders. We need to be praying for our leaders in Roman or excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. The Bible says, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings, and all who are in high positions, that we may lead peaceable and quiet lives. 
godly and dignified in every way. This is good and is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires for all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Folks, why is it important to pray for our leaders? Well, we can say, well, we want to live quiet and peaceable lives, but God also desires for all to come to the knowledge of the truth. He desires all people to be saved. And, you know, folks, I, I think any sane person would desire this. Any sane person, any person in their right mind would desire to live their life in peace. That's what we want. We want to live quiet and peaceable lives. But that's not going to happen unless we pray for our leaders. And whether we agree with their politics or not, you know, I find it interesting that that's not a caveat thrown into the text. I may disagree with the president. I may disagree with a congressman. That doesn't matter. As a Christian, I should pray for them because I want to live a quiet and peaceable life and God desires all to come to the knowledge of the truth. This leads to point number three. And that is that it's time for Christians to take a stand. Christians need to take a stand. Now, by taking a stand, this does not mean rebellion or mutiny. You know, as some people have talked about taking up arms against the government. No, that's that's not what I mean by taking a stand. What I simply mean is that we need to take a stand for what is in God's word. For example, in Acts chapter 5, 27 through 29, notice what the Bible says. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charge you not charge you not to teach in this name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. Now, a little bit of context. Peter and John, as well as some of the other apostles, have been arrested for teaching in the name of Jesus. In chapter 4, they were told, don't teach in the name of Jesus anymore. Did they listen? Of course they did not listen. And Peter and the other apostles are brought before the council, and they're told, this is the Sanhedrin council in Jerusalem, by the way, and they were questioned by the high priest. The high priest says, you know, we told you to stop teaching in the name of Jesus. And I find it interesting. They say, we're going to obey God instead of you. You know, folks, in our country, there are a lot of Christians who have become pacifists. And I'm not talking pacifists because they're not vocal and because they're not activists. What I mean is... As Christians, we've kind of passed the buck off to someone else. We pass the buck off to special interest groups and lobbyists. You know, we'll, we'll give money to uh, some particular uh, special interest. But is that really going to fix the problem? You know, one of my most liberal friends, and I couldn't believe this came from this particular person, but one of my friends one time told me, you know, we wouldn't need the lobbyists if we focused more on changing the hearts of the people. Because if you change the hearts of the people, you change who is in office. And I know what some people are going to say, especially when it comes to, you know, certain issues that people have with law enforcement and those that are in authority, they're going to say, well, you know, I understand not all police or not everyone who's in authority is bad, but man, it just, it just seems so unjust and I don't, I don't know what to do. Well, let me, uh, let me put it to you this way. 
in your city, you have a mayor. That mayor is a democratically elected official. Now, it's the mayor's responsibility to appoint, hire, or fire the police chief. The police chief, in turn, is in charge of who works under him, who his subordinates are. Thus, if you change the elected official, you can change the person in command. And you change the person in command, such as the police chief, you change who is going to be patrolling your streets. Thus, if you put in a godly mayor, a person concerned with godly principles, then they can take care of things and it's a trickle-down effect from there. Folks, here's the point I'm trying to make. Christians need to take a stand. Regardless of what the press says, regardless of what the world says, regardless of what social media has to say, Christians need to take a stand. And in this country, we have an avenue for that. It's called the ballot box. And I'm not getting all political here. I'm not trying to, at least. But if we want to truly seek justice, love mercy, to walk humbly with our God, we have to make choices. And those choices will dictate what we do and how we handle situations. But it will also dictate how they are handled in our communities, in our cities, in our states, and in our country. You know, there, it, it seems like there are so many opinions today uh, about what we should do and how we should respond. And a lot of them, a lot of them are not peaceful. A lot of them are nothing more than rebellion against God and the institutions that he has put in place. But we as Christians need to learn from a text like Micah 6, 6 through 8. We as Christians need to seek justice, live lives in accordance with God's word. We need to love kindness. We need to get back to showing love and showing mercy and showing kindness. Folks, that's kind of how we got into this situation to begin with, right? We forgot what it meant to show kindness and love to others. And we need to get back to bringing our lives in subjection to Christ. And with that, the lesson is yours for this Lord's Day morning. My only hope is you, my only hope, Jesus, my only hope, my hope is you, is you Lord. From early in the morning till late at night, my only hope is you, and my only peace, my only peace is you, my only peace is you, Jesus, my only peace. My only joy is you. My only joy.